We thank you that you love us and that you sent your son into this world to rescue us from our sin. And that through his death on the cross and his resurrection, we have hope, we have life, we have a reason to celebrate. And so this morning, we pray that you would meet us here and you would communicate your love and your truth into our lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to Matthew chapter 2 as we continue our series, Journey of Christmas. Um, If you don't have a Bible or a Bible app on your device, then grab one of the the Bibles in the pews around you. They look like this. We'd love for you to take that and use that. If you don't have the Word of God, we want you to take it with you when you leave. If you need a Bible, then feel free to take one of these with you. Uh, Got to tell you, I hate being sick. And yet, uh, I am that today, and so my voice, uh, I'm fighting a cold, and it settles right there in the throat. So if I sound weird at times, I hear it too. And, uh, and yeah, I feel like I sound, so, uh, uh, you know, just part of life, isn't it? Don't you love the Christmas season, though? Not, not because of the sickness, but don't you, guys, don't you really just love the Christmas season? I, I mean, how many of you are Christmas, you know, aficionados? You just love it. Yeah, okay. Lots of hands going up. Not everybody, but that's okay. You know, it's the lights, it's the decorations, it's the parties, it's the, the big dinners, it's the pretty packages. Actually, my favorite is the joy on the kids' faces, isn't it? You know, they just, they just beam. They're so excited they can't stand it. Uh, downstairs right now, they're having a blast just because they all know that Christmas is like three days away. And, and so they're just, you know, they're having a great time. And, and the families come home for Christmas. I mean, I'm excited because my girls are home, which is really funny because I'm sick and my oldest daughter is sick. She lost her voice. We're just staring at each other, uh, <laughs> smiling. You know, it's like, hey, we're here. We can't really visit or catch up or anything. But, uh, uh, but we enjoy Christmas because it unites us as a culture. It, it, it brings us together. You think about all the things that unite, the, the music of Christmas. Everybody listens to the same Christmas songs. They play them all different kinds of ways, but everybody knows the same songs. And you hear Christmas stuff everywhere, and you kind of go, oh, it's Christmas. We all all listen to that music. And we're all doing the same things. You know, we've all got shopping to do. You know, whether you just got to find the right gift cards or the right gift, doesn't matter. We're all got these tasks, and we've all got too many gatherings to go to and travel to take care of, or people coming in, and, and all that kind of stuff, it unites us. It's a sentimental and joyous time. And it's really nothing at all like the biblical account of Jesus' birth. You see, Christmas is a story of deliverance. It's a story of deliverance. Matthew chapter 2, picking up in verse 13. Now, you know the story up to this point. We've been walking through this journey. And we've talked about how the Matthew account of Jesus' birth kind of follows Joseph and talks about that. And the Luke account of Jesus' birth follows kind of Mary and what happens. But we've talked about Joseph, how he was betrothed to Mary, and he was going to divorce her because she was pregnant, and he knew he wasn't the dad. And an angel came and talked to him, and and he decided that he was going to take Mary to be his wife because the Holy Spirit had conceived the child in her, and he was going to be the Son of God, the Messiah. And, And so he took Mary to be his wife, and And last week we talked about how the the wise men discovered Jesus. They were searching for him. They came to Jerusalem and and turned that city upside down because they said, where's the one born king of the Jews? And nobody knew anything. And they go, well, Bethlehem's where that's going to happen. And they went to Bethlehem and they found Jesus and they worshiped Jesus. And and usually that's kind of where we stop reading in Matthew about the Christmas story, but it doesn't end there. Pick up in verse 13. Now when they, the wise men, had departed... Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. So Herod wants to kill the child. Herod's the king of of Judea, 
and, and he doesn't want any rivals. By the way, Herod was like one of the craziest kings that ever lived. I mean, he killed, you know, half his own family because he, he thought they were trying to take over his power. And, but he doesn't want a rival. And so if there's a baby that's born the king of the Jews, and he's going to try and kill that baby. And so he tries to get the magi, the wise men, to tell him where the baby is. And they don't do that. They're warned by God in a dream to lead, leave a different way. And so Herod discovers that, and, and, and he's, he's furious. He wants to kill this rival. And God rescued Jesus by sending an angel to Joseph. God rescued Jesus by sending an angel to Joseph. Now remember, Jesus is the one and only God-man. He's God incarnate. He's God in the flesh. But as Jesus became man, he laid aside all of his power. He, he laid aside all of his glory. And, and so he wasn't born a super baby able to, you know, sh- kill bad guys just with a glance. He was helpless like we're helpless. He was weak like the babies that we hold are weak. He, he needed someone to take care of him. That's right, we've got a baby right over here. Now, that little baby can't do anything except what mom's taking, doing for him. And, and see, that's, that's weakness. That's, and babies are given to us, and moms and dads are entrusted with those children to protect and care for those, those babies. Guess what? God gave Jesus to Mary and Joseph and said, I want you to protect my child. You provide for him. You protect him. And so God knows that Herod's going to try and kill Jesus. So he sends an angel to Joseph and warns him. And Joseph has been down this road before, hasn't he? You know, the angel in a dream thing, by now he's got the routine down. Pretty good. It's like, oh, it's another angel. I'm telling me what to do. And, and so, so he doesn't mess around with this. He just says, like, okay, I, I got to go to Egypt. Then I'm going to pack up the family, and we're going to Egypt. We're leaving tonight. Uh, you know, Mary's like, but we've got this business going, and we've got all this stuff, and we've got a house now. And we got, It doesn't matter. Pack it all up. We're leaving. And they go to Egypt. And God protects Jesus by sending an angel to Joseph. They're delivered. And I really wish the story in Scripture ended right there. I really wish that was the end of Matthew chapter 2 and we could go on to the the rest of Jesus' life. But the Christmas story, the story of Jesus' birth, the narrative in Matthew doesn't end. And we need to understand that Christmas is about the tragedy of our broken world. It, It really is about a tragedy. Now, Christmas is a season of joy and family for many. We've already talked about that. There's a lot of hands that went up. I love Christmas. It's so much fun. It's so exciting. And the family's coming home and all this kind of stuff. But Christmas is also a season of loss and despair and loneliness for many. It's a time that hurts. It's a time when, when the pain of life sometimes uh, overwhelms. And, and if we're honest about it, there's a lot of us that... Uh, are celebrating Christmas, and we want the joy, and we want the happiness, we want the decorations, and we don't really want to enter into the pain of the people who can't celebrate with us. And a lot of times we say really callous things, like just get over it, and come on, and, and move on, and, and life is still waiting, and, and they're lost in their agony. And so we look past or ignore their forced smiles, or we just don't see them because they hide during the holidays, Because they are overwhelmed by pain and by grief. But the truth is, the Christmas story fits them better. If you're one of those that is just touched by pain and loss and sorrow and and Christmas is hard for you to really get excited about, really hard for you to celebrate. I know you go and you show up and you do the things, but there's no joy in it for you. I want you to understand that the Christmas story in Scripture is your story. Because Herod slaughtered the innocents. Story continues, verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old and under according to the time he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what the, was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. 
She refused to be comforted because they are no more. See, the Christmas story is a tragedy. It's exactly the opposite of every Hallmark Christmas special you've ever seen. All right, go ahead and confess it. How many of you watch the Hallmark Christmas specials? Okay, a lot of hands go up. They're on in my house too. Not, not really by my choice, but, you know, I have a wife and a daughter that love them. And, and they record them, and then they sit and watch them like it's a marathon of tears. And, <laughs> and the thing is, they all end, you know, they're all the same story. They just have different, you know, settings and, and different people. But there's, you know, there's sorrow, there's brokenness, there's, you know, all these things. Someone's going bankrupt, a marriage falling apart. And, and, and they all end the same way. Everything works out really good. Yeah. They all get back together. They have a big family reunion. You know, they get a check in the mail. They get healed. They get everything is just hunky-dory, and we smile and we feel good. And, and that's the opposite of the biblical account because this doesn't have a happy ending. The reality is an evil tyrant named Herod ordered his soldiers to go into Bethlehem and in all the area around there trying to find a rival-born king of the Jews, and he had his soldiers massacre a bunch of two-year-old and younger boys. Kicking in doors, taking them out of the arms of their mom, destroying lives. And we ask why. Now, I'm pretty sure you've never probably heard a sermon at Christmas about this. Because I know I grew up in church and never, ever did. We always stopped at the wise men going home. Because it feels better. But the problem is, when we actually read the Bible, we find stuff that makes us uncomfortable. And it, and it really does make us go, why? Why would God let Herod do that? Why would God deliver Jesus and not those other children? Why would God let my loved one die? Why would God let my child suffer or become an addict? Why would God let my boss fire me or my spouse leave me? Why? And a lot of us are just like those mothers in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, and we refuse to be comforted. And it makes it all the worse when we're supposed to put on a hat and smile and sing songs and, and decorate trees and, and do all of that. And yet in our souls, we're going, why? Why is it this way? Well, the Bible answers that too. See, it's this way because God created a perfect world and then he put us in charge of it. Not you and me specifically, but our ancestors. He put them in charge of it, and he pretty much gave them one rule, and they broke it because they decided that they knew how to live life better than God. That's why we know they're our ancestors because we're still doing that family trait, aren't we? We think we know how to live life better than God, and so we do life our way, and then we wonder why it doesn't work out. We wonder why there's destruction and pain. Well, when Adam and Eve sinned, when they rebelled against God, they threw open the door to sin. And Scripture says that just as through one man sin entered the world, and with sin came, well, what's always hanging out with sin? Death. With sin came death. Therefore, everyone died because everyone sinned. Yeah. You see, we're all touched by death because all of us live in a world where we are tainted by sin and we're touched by sin and we choose to sin. And so this thing called death it, it, and decay and destruction is rampant in our world because we have rebelled against God's authority. We've rejected his path. And, and here's what happens when sinful people have power. They do evil and selfish things to other people. I mean, it's just reality. It's what they do. When sinful people have power, there's lying and cheating and stealing. There's adultery and abuse and rape and assault and murder and genocide and even the slaughter of babies. That's what evil people do. You see, our world is broken, it is hopeless, it is destined for hell. That's our reality, and that's the reason for Christmas. We need a Savior. 
That's the reason for Christmas. We need a Savior. See, our world is filled with evil because we choose to be evil towards one another. You do realize that all of the destruction that's out there is just amplification of what you and I do on a daily basis. You see, the, the, the death that, that's magnified among nations and among people groups is just anger taken to the extreme. The, the stealing, the, the abuse, all of that is just selfishness taken to the extreme. And so when we treat each other with contempt, when we treat each other with anger, when we treat each other with, you know, with uh, uh, violence, with words that destroy, with, with, with selfish desires within our hearts, then what we're doing is we're feeding this beast of destruction in this world. So how can that be changed? What's going to make a difference in this world in the way that we treat each other with this evil? Well, let me tell you what's not going to change the world. Social action promoting justice is not going to change the world. Now, I believe in promoting justice. I believe that we ought to do things to make a difference in our world. But guess what? It's not going to change the world. It's not going to make people treat each other better. That's just fact. Guess what? Just redistributing the wealth so that everybody has the same amount is not going to take away the evil from this world. That's not going to remove greed at all. And, and sensitivity training is not going to change the world, although God knows some of you need it. Uh, you know, just because we sit in a room and they say you got to respect everyone doesn't mean that we're actually going to respect anyone. And it doesn't mean that we're going to treat them with kindness and, and, and compassion just because somebody tells us we're supposed to. Guess what else isn't going to change the world? Democracy and capitalism. I'm all for democracy and capitalism, but guess what? That's not the answer to the world, what, what makes people hate each other and destroy each other and do violence towards each other. There aren't laws you can pass. There aren't resolutions that can be passed. There aren't, you know, you can't disarm people enough to make them like each other and treat each other well. The only way that we're going to treat each other better, the only way we're going to make this world less evil is to experience a life-changing relationship with the Savior, Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the reason for Christmas, because we need a Savior. See, here's what happens. If we actually discover that God loves us, if you and I come to grips with the reality that, that Jesus loves you enough to pursue you from heaven, that he came to this earth and, and was clothed as an infant in weakness and humility, and that he loved you and me enough to take our sin, our rebellion, our defiance upon himself and, and be nailed to a cross to redeem us from hell. When we realize that God loves us that much, it makes it possible for me and you to love our neighbor as ourself. It makes it possible for me and you to love our neighbor as ourself. And when we understand that we are created in the image of Almighty God, that every single person who draws breath in this world is made in the image of God. That, that, that God placed a part of himself in us. Now, I, I realize it's broken, it's shattered, it's defiled, it's messed up in all these different ways, but it's still there. And therefore, every person has value because. That's it. When we realize those two things as followers of Jesus Christ, it gives us the ability to value people. People who are like us, people who are different from us, people all around us. It allows us to do that. And, and you see, that's what will change the world. When people who are followers of Jesus Christ start loving their neighbor as themselves and valuing every single life and acting out of those principles above everything else. And, and you do realize where I'm going with this, or at least I hope you do. And the fact is that we're losing the debate in the public square because we're not doing that. You see, the world keeps getting worse because those of us who know the light and know the truth, who know the Savior, are more interested in declaring it than we are in living it. And you and I can change the world by loving the world the way that Jesus loved the world. You and I can change the world by valuing the lives of people the way that God values our lives. 
And he sent his son to redeem us. You see, we need a savior and the world needs a savior. And that's why Christmas is the story of deliverance. You see, God rescued us by sending Jesus. It's a story of deliverance where God rescued his son from Herod. But it's the story of deliverance because God has rescued us from hell. Think about it this way. God rescued Jesus from the temporary wrath of Herod so that Jesus could rescue us from the eternal anguish of hell. That's what's happening in the Christmas story. That's why God tells us the account. That's why he shows us the evil and says, look, this is what I came to redeem you from. It's out there and it's real and you know it because you live in the pain of it and you see it all around you and you pray that God protect your children from it. But God rescued Jesus from the temporary wrath of King Herod so that Jesus could rescue me and you from the eternal anguish of separation from God. See, we were lost. We had no hope. We were dead in our sins until Jesus invaded our world as an infant. And, and of course, he didn't stay an infant. He grew into a man. He lived a sinless life. He became the sacrifice for our sins upon the cross. He was raised from the dead so that we could be set free, so that we could be forgiven of all of our sins, so that we could be redeemed, and so that we could become righteous in God's sight. Not because of anything that we have done, but because of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice and his blood. You see, God's answer to the senseless tragedy of the Bethlehem slaughter is hope. Hope. Hope in Jesus Christ, a Savior. Hope that goes way beyond the pain of this world. Hope of eternal life. Hope of existence without death and destruction where selfishness and evil is done away with forever. You see, that's what Christmas is all about. That's the real Christmas story. That's why we celebrate. That's why we sing. That's why we, we encourage people to, go, you know, to come and worship and then to go out and share that joy because we have hope through Jesus Christ. That's the story of Christmas. Jesus is our Savior. And that's what we pray that you understand today above everything else. And I pray that the message of the angel in the Gospel of Luke rings true in your heart today. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy that shall be for all people. For unto you this day in the city of David is born to you a Savior. He is Christ the Lord. Let's pray. Father, this morning we come to celebrate you, to worship you, to tell you that we love you, and to thank you for setting us free. We don't deserve forgiveness of sins. We don't deserve the, the grace that you have poured out upon us. But we gladly receive it as sons and daughters of God. And Father, I pray that each person in this room today would, would know the love of Christ that has pursued them from heaven would celebrate the grace that is offered to them as a gift from God and would leave this place filled with joy, even in the midst of their pain and their sorrow, knowing that the pain and sorrow is temporary, but the joy lasts forever. Thank you, Jesus, for rescuing us. It's in his name we pray. Amen.